Praise the Lord on this glorious day, for this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, I'm Leon Pinkett, Assistant Pastor at New Harvest Ministries, and welcome to our Midday Mealtime Inspiration. Um, come on in and join as we dine together on the Word of God. Pray God's Spirit would guide us and lead us in this fellowship in His Word. So let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer and get right into our lesson for today. Dear Lord, we thank you for this glorious day that you've blessed us with. God, um, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase, that your spirit would lead us in this study. Lord, I thank you for those who are participating. Um, count it not robbery to be a part of this uh, midday Bible study. Um, lead us, guide us, inspire us, so that we would be the better as a result of the time that we spent. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. And so thank you again for joining us. Um, during this time of study, I pr pray that you've been blessed and um, thank you for your patience as we uh, get our schedule back on. Um, but we want to um, speak today from a continuing lesson that we've been going over at New Harvest uh, for the past couple weeks now, coming out of James. And so today we want to look at a lesson entitled, yeah, entitled Pass the test, pass the test. And we're going to look at just a couple chapters in James today. James chapter one, we're going to look at verses two through four in James as we study um, this very intentional book where James really uh, gives us practical advice, guidance, instructions, leading on what it means to practice Christianity and the practicality of doing so. And so uh, let's get right into James and, and see what James has for, for us on this day. So James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, um, in the NIV version, it says, consider it, pure, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of ma many kinds, because you know that the testing of your, of your faith produces perseverance. And so let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. You see, James, the half-brother of Jesus, um, at the time of the writing of this letter, he was a prominent leader in the Jerusalem church. Um, and he writes this letter in the early years of the church to a group of Jewish Christians that were facing trials and persecutions. They were um, significant um, oppression that they faced in following their faith. And the heat of the oppression that they faced was literally pushing them or propelling them um, or causing some to consider abandoning their commitment to Christ and returning to the ways of the culture and the society that they found themselves in. They, the, the pressures, oftentimes we, we find it difficult to relate to that because many of us don't live under those types of persecution, but these believers were being persecuted to the degree that they were um, considering just giving up and and throwing in the towel and, and just um, aligning themselves with the dictates of the culture and the society and no longer following um, after Christ. And so these believers who were once associated with the church in Jerusalem, um, in God's, through God's providence, if we look in uh, Acts chapter 8, they had been scattered when Stephen was martyred. We remember this, the account of Stephen being uh, stoned and so upon his martyrdom, many of these believers got displaced throughout the Mediter Mediterranean region. And so this is why James opens the book when, when he says in uh, verse 1, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then immediately, James begins to address the theme of trials and suffering, really uh, throughout this first um, chapter of James but there are um, aspects of it throughout the entire letter. And so James recognizes the condition that these believers found themselves in, and uh, he um, recognizes the priority of making certain that he gives them a word of encouragement, a word of instruction um, immediately. So James doesn't waste any time. He doesn't beat around the bush. He jumps right into his message immediately because he recognizes how drastic and how severe the situation is that these believers find themselves in. And so James, in 
these uh, three verses, he gives us three uh, uh, points that come out of the trials that these believers are facing. And so the first aspect or first point that James makes to us as a point of instruction or as an admonishment to this group of believers, and the truth be told, he's speaking to us um, in the 21st century, he's not just speaking to the first century church, is that um, James uh, instructs them in the aspect of that the testing of our faith or testing of their faith should produce joy. The testing of their faith, the, the fruit of it should be that it will produce joy. And so James, again, in verse two, he says, consider it pure joy, uh, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. And so James, um, his address to, um, he, well, he addresses this to his brothers and sisters because first and foremost, they are all part of the family, family of God. Um, you see, when we think about the church, when we think about the body of Christ, the, the, the church is an assembly of people meeting together, but is much more a family sharing and caring for each other. See, the church isn't just what we do on Sunday mornings when we come to our worship experience. The church isn't just a club or an affiliation that we find ourselves in. It is a, it is a family. It is a body of, of believers who share a commonality in Christ. And as a result of that, there should be some sharing and there should, should be some caring that happens amongst believers. And so that's why in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. See, us coming together should be inspirational and it should cause for us to want to encourage others towards love and towards good deeds. And so verse 25 says, not giving up meeting together, which is that assembly, um, which some are in the habit of doing, especially in this post-COVID environment where people have uh, fallen away from the assembly of the saints, which in the right of Hebrews um, back then, he admonishes us not to let happen, um, almost as he had, if he had a, a crystal ball looking into the future of the potential for people to fall away and not uh, value the assembling of ourselves together. And Hebrews, and he can, goes on to say, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So James tells his readers uh, to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And so to the persecuted Jewish believers scattered among pagan peoples, James, this message or this advice that James gave had to have been surprising considering the condition that they found themselves in. I don't think they were looking, they probably were looking for James to be maybe a little bit more sympathetic to their cause and not telling them that, oh, by the way, you need to find joy in the midst of your suffering. And so he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials, uh, when it, um, giving the assumption that there will be trials and that you will face situations and, and circumstances. That's not if you face trials of many kinds. He says whenever, because the expectation is that if you live this life, if uh, as long as you live in this flesh, you're going to experience something. Um, it might not be today and it might not be tomorrow, but live long enough and you will experience something. And that these trials should be faced with an attitude of joy. And so James challenges them to change their perspective. Trials should not be seen as punishment. It should not be seen as a curse or a calamity but something that must prompt rejoicing. See, the trials that come from God, they aren't designed to destroy us. They are meant to, to construct us. They aren't uh, designed to deflate us. They're supposed to build us up. And so James sends a message to them that the trials that you face aren't a punishment from God and they're not a curse from God. Matter of fact, they are, they are designed to uh, encourage a response of praise and rejoicing from you. And so furthermore, they should produce not just joy, but pure joy, not just some joy that, that also comes with some grief, but no, just the, the pure expression of joy that's unmixed 
and, and, and full of, of the glory of God. And when we look at his language in these, this second verse, James says the, to uh, consider. And so the verb consider means to think. It means to regard. Um, it speaks of a mental effort to regard an event from a certain vantage point. In the case of James, consider means to exchange our earthly perspective for God's heavenly, eternal perspective. It's more important to note that James did not say that a believer should be joyous for the trials, but in the trials. You see, we're not sadomasochists. We're, we, we, we're not looking for pain or punishment or suffering. Um, I would imagine that most of us don't sit around praying for a trial. We're not joyful for the trial, but with God, we are to find joy in it. The verb translated face might be more literally expressed as fall into or perpacete, uh, which can be found when we look in Luke chapter three, I'm sorry, Luke 30, I mean, Luke chapter 10, verse 30, when Jesus gives the, the parable or the account of the Good Samaritan, where in Luke, uh, in verse 30, it says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Uh, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And so in that, uh, um, in that expression, when he was attacked by robbers, it is in an expression of him falling or f falling amongst robbers or falling prey to robbers. And so this verb translated face is, is as if this is not something of your causation, but because of life, because of situations, this individual who is now in this trial or test has kind of fallen into this scenario or this situation. And so when surrounded by these trials, one should respond with joy. And so most people um, count it all joy when we escape trials. Rarely do you see people count it all joy when we're in the midst of trials. But James is encouraging us that there is joy in the trial. Uh, there is uh, a praise in the test. But we've got to consider God is in it and what God is trying to achieve in the midst of that trial. And so the second thing that James wants us to achieve out of this experience of the trial is that the testing of our faith should produce perseverance. The testing of our faith should produce perseverance. And so in verse three of that same first chapter of James, the Bible says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You see, God is not the initiator of suffering, but in his grace, mercy, and love for us, he has the ability, and not just the ability, but the desire to cause that suffering to be for our benefit. And so as a result, God can use these circumstances to develop perseverance for, or, or patience in us. See, God uses this situation to either develop an aspect of our spiritual character. God will use a, a trial to either get us into a, a, a different position, posture, or place. And so in the hands of God, that Romans 8.28 becomes alive where the Bible talks about all things work together for the good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. See, God is the only one who has the ability to uh, cause for these trials and these tests to work out for our good. And so as a result, God uses them to develop perseverance and also patience. But how does God do it? So God do, does it. Um, an example of it is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, where uh, Peter describes it this way. And he says, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perisheth, what perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. You see, um, God refines us through the test by burning off everything that doesn't look like him. He, 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 he burns off, I think, what's called the dross, and what is left is what is pure. 
And so all of our motives and all of our conducts that are not in align with his will and word, um, they burn off. And what happens is all of that negativity, all of those things that don't look like God, all of those things that steer us away from the presence of the Lord, those things are burnt off. And what remains is the perseverance and the patience. And so not only does he test us, but he tests us exactly where we need to be tried. And that's in our faith. Um, he doesn't test us in our will. He doesn't test us in our mind or our emotions. He tests us in the place where we commune and communicate with God. You see, faith is the place where we come to God. Faith is the place where we follow God. Faith is the place where we receive from God. And faith is the place where we experience the victory that overcomes the world. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the Bible says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So if you want to come to God, you come to him through faith. If you want to follow God, you follow him in faith. And if you want to receive from God, you receive from him in faith. And if you want to experience the victory that God has for each and every one of us, we do it through that place called faith. So, so James tells us that not only is the testing of our faith, not only does it produce joy, and not only does it produce perseverance, but he also lets us know that the testing of our faith should make us perfect. Um, it should make us complete. And so in verse 4, in that same chapter in James, James says, let perseverance finish um, its work so that we may be mature and we may be complete, lacking, not lacking anything. And so what we see is that the first benefit um, we can enjoy in our lives as we allow perseverance to finish its work is that of maturity. You see, the, the trials that we face, the tests that we face are no different than those that we face in the natural to some degree. Um, a student who goes to school and dislikes taking the quiz or the test um, may not always appreciate the fact that the, that the teacher, the administrator, the instructor has that individual going through the test in order to mature them, in order to prove that they've received and learned the lesson. The, the test is not designed to make the student smart. The test is designed to show and exalt what the student has already achieved and already learned. And so even with us in our test, and to some degree, the test isn't designed to develop the faith in us. The test is designed to show the faith that's already in, in, existing in us. And so God allows for these tests uh, for him to get glory, ultimately, but also for us to learn and to experience the fact that, yes, we have grown in Christ. And yes, we are walking in faith and that we might not recognize or realize it um, outside of the test. We might not know how much we've grown and how much we've matured in Christ. And so these tests allow for us to see that, experience it, but also for us to mature in him. And so to be mature is... Um, uh, the Greek word teleos, and it means to be perfect, it means to be complete, and it means to be full grown. And so this is the word which Jesus uses um, in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that's Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. And so our human response to that command probably is that that's impossible. No one can be perfect but God. And, and while that is true, Jesus is, uh, he wouldn't have given such a commandment unless there was an expectation that we uh, um, would have a greater understanding what he means when he's telling us to be perfect. And of course, we can't reach this state of perfection um, while we're in the flesh, um, but that doesn't mean that we should not strive for, for, for perfection um, in our walk with Christ. And so when we look at Philippians chapter uh, 3, yes, Philippians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 14, 
the the uh, Apostle Paul, he puts this notion of perfection into a, a uh, its right perspective. And so in uh, these three verses, what he says is, not that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal. See, we haven't already achieved and we haven't already arrived. That's, that's not what James is trying to say in his perfection. But what Paul comes behind and what, what Paul says that um, clarifies a little bit of, of this notion of perfection is that um, that doesn't keep me from striving and moving forward. And so Paul says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In verse 13, it says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I'm not perfect, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards or pressing towards what is ahead, I, I press on towards the goal or the mark to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so while we will never be perfect in this flesh, we are, God is still calling for us to uh, seek to live a life that aligns with his will and his way, and that our, our heart and our mind would be, our desire would be to be obedient to God. Ephesians 4, uh, I think, yeah, Ephesians 4 and 13 says, um, shows us that, in fact, some of this perfection is also a response or a part of the church, a part of the ministries that we find ourselves in. That's why we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's important for us to be in the, in the ministry. And, and Paul, again, in Ephesians 4.13, gives us another aspect of what this perfection uh, should look like and, and what it means. And so um, Paul in verse 13 says, until we all reach unity in the faith, and he's talking about the gifts that are a part of the body of Christ that are designed for the maturing of believers. And so we come in the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. See, there we go again with this perfection, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so James is encouraging to con for the believers to consider it joy while they're in their trials, understanding that God is working out this perseverance. He's maturing them. He's He's um, causing for them to be perfect um, in their desire and their walk after him. And so as we, as we continue with uh, James and uh, what he seeks to uh, get out of the believers, we find that he, he goes on to admonish them to let to let this uh, uh, trial or let this test continue to work out and to cause for that perseverance and patience to be developed in each and every believer as they withstand the trial or the testing and we so in James we see that as we allow patience to have its perfect work we become increasingly complete. We we become whole. We become entire. Um, we become perfect in every part. And but James goes on further to say, um, in verse four, he says, "Let perseverance finish its work, which is critical, so that we may be mature, complete." But then he also says that, so that we would be lacking, um, we wouldn't be lacking anything. We would be lacking nothing. And in this, uh, this word perseverance here, we see this notion of the Greek word of holikleros, which means entire or perfect or in every part. So God uses the trials to perfect us. He, he uses the trials so that we would be complete. He uses the trials so we wouldn't be lacking in any, any area. And so um, in closing, James uh, confirms that and in and, and doing so, God's desire is that we wouldn't lack anything, that there would be, we would be complete, we would be full grown, we would be perfect in our, um, our every part, we wouldn't be deficient, we wouldn't want anything, we wouldn't need anything as it relates to our spiritual walk. Uh, that, that trial of our faith would uh, bring us in alignment with God's will and his way and that 
Um, even our walk would be a representative of that relationship that we share with God. And so James admonishes us to pass the test, uh, that the trial of our faith, it's, it is a test, but if we consider it with joy, um, we let the patience finish, finish its work, that it will produce perseverance and patience, and it will mature us, it will complete us, and we will be not lacking anything. So what did we learn from James? We learned that the testing of our faith should produce joy, the testing of our faith should produce perseverance, and the testing of our faith should make us perfect and complete. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time of study. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the trials and the tests that you bring in our lives. Although we, uh, we don't rejoice for, for the suffering, we can rejoice in the suffering because you're in there guiding us and you're working it out for our benefit. And so, God, uh, teach us to uh, find joy um, in the midst of our, uh, the testing of our faith, uh, God, that we would persevere in it, and God, that we would become perfect in it because of the maturity that you're bringing us to through the testing of our faith. And so, God, we thank you and we bless you. Um, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Pray that you were blessed during our time of study and look forward to uh, seeing you on tomorrow as we continue to study how faith works and how we continue to come together during our midday mealtime. God bless you. Love you.